Good morning, good morning, good morning. I am Daniel, pastor here at the McCordsville United Methodist Church. I want to welcome everyone that's gathering here in person and those gathering online to our 11-11 hour of worship. And our hope and our prayer is just like as we read in the Gospels, how Jesus met people upon the step of life that they were on, that Jesus, our Lord, would meet us upon the step of life that we are all on today. And in that meeting, my prayer, our hope, is that we would experience his grace and that we would experience his love. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going to have a word of prayer and uh, continue in a time of worship. Let's pray together. Father, today we just come before you just so thankful that we could gather here in this place in your son's most holy name. We pray that you, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work of grace within each and every one of our hearts. We pray that through this time of fellowship and through this time of worship, that you would place us all upon the, your potter's wheel and that you would mold us and that you would shape us, God, into the people that you know by your grace that we could be. We give you full reign in this time. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 I haven't even started service and I'm already out of breath. How about that? Let's stand as we begin to worship this morning. Sorry, something was wrong. Technical difficulties.
Oh, calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, Oh, calm down, Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. Calm down, Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and with the new. Let's uh, join me now as we continue our worship at the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Take a moment. Greet one another. Tell them you're glad to see them. Glad to see Glad to see you. Glad you found a movie. Good to see you, Addison Ray. Oh, yeah. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Lovely. Addie has Reggie's face on her socks today. Yes, indeed. You may be seated, may be seated, may be seated. It is good to be together. I really enjoyed that last song. It's got like a, just, there was something really, I don't know. Even like the whole groove of it, the words, the whole, and then it like, it like built to this crescendo, and I was just like, ah, it's good stuff. Yes, yes, yes. Well, tonight we are continuing what we call the Chosen Nights, uh, where we watch an episode of The Chosen, and then have discussion around The Chosen and the scripture that The Chosen had uh, used uh, to, uh, to make the, inform the episode. It's been really, really fun nights. Um, this is what, the fourth? So we're on episode four, episode four. If you've not been to any of them, you don't really, like, you can jump in at any point and still uh, it can be an impactful evening. Uh, anywhere from 15 to 40 people have been attending these things. And so it's really just, uh, it's been really a good time. If you want to catch up and want to come tonight, just watch the first three episodes. You're probably talking an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes of, uh, of, of the word, you know, on, on the screen kind of thing. Uh, so it wouldn't really take too long to, to, to get caught up. But really, it's incredible. It's fun. Everyone's welcome to come out and, uh, and hang out with us as we watch The Chosen. The plan, the long-term plan, is this year we'll watch season one and have discussion and then in the fall, we're going to do season two, do the same thing. Then next year, continue with season three and four. So that is the long-term plan that we have with that. United Methodist men are going to be meeting on February the 5th at 6.30. There's always a meal at that one. Missions team is going to be meeting the next night, and that is going to be the 6th, and that is at 6.30 p.m., that group deals with every, all, really all kinds of things, everything from church activities to, you know, missional outreaches within our community. Um, so, uh, so really, really awesome stuff. And again, to recap um, last month's uh, ministry that we were able to do, uh, we were able to help eight families uh, at Christmas. One of those families had seven children, so we were able to, to impact countless lives over, over uh, the Christmas, uh, Christmas holiday. And then our food pantry served 450 different families, or 450 families in the month of December.
member. Um, so really, you kind of think about the impact that a 100, 125 person church, 150 plus online, you know, it's like, it's amazing to see what God is able to do. And, and, and that pantry started with us just opening it up for people that, you know, needed some food to during uh, the, the pandemic, um, serving 10 to 20 people a week, now serving anywhere from 85 to 135 uh, families every single week. And you might be curious how, we, how that's all possible. Um, we've partnered with different uh, food distribution folks in the Indianapolis area, like Midwest Food Groups and uh, Gleaners, and, uh, and then folks like you have been very generous in supporting that effort uh, to feed the community. But you think about it, 450 a month of December, 400, you know, on average every month. And think about how many families are being impacted uh, by us as a congregation. It's really cool to think about. Um, last piece, and, and this is kind of a, you know, pray for this, but Meyer has now approached us and is wanting to partner with us as well in feeding the community. And we keep seeing things like this open up. Um, uh, the gas station north of town, um, they, uh, Leo's did a food drive for us. I mean, it's just continually seeing God open doors for us to be able um, to, to leverage the resources that we have to feed the hungry. So cool stuff, very cool stuff. And with that, Corey? Let's continue in an attitude of worship as we stand and continue to sing. And 
dominions, all powers and positions. Your name stands above them all. And Jesus, your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, holy, all creation cry. Running after, 
it's running after me with my life laid down I've surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after me it's running after me all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see the goodness of God today just thank goodness a God song man mm, good stuff indeed indeed before I get into preaching something that we like to do is share good news with one another it's uh, in a world where we can get pumped full of negative and bad and critical and all that kind of stuff kind of news it's good to share some good news together yes can be replaced. Amen. That's good news. Yes. You can deal with a car that needs to be replaced indeed. But yeah, wow. Definitely. Anyone else? Anyone else? And we have yes. You are here, Addy. It's always so good. You're, you're like a ray of sunshine. And you're even have an orange shirt on. So it's kind of, you know, in the you know, blonde hair. It's like sunshine. It's salmon. salmon? That's what you call Okay. Well, it's close. It looks orange to me. Corey, you had something? And then we'll move up. I got a, I got a couple. So, boys are actually starting daycare. Oh. <laughs> that, that is awesome. February 5th. This is what I heard, maybe, right? Yes. Yeah, man. They can't take it back now because we've got the app and they've taken our money. And... <laughs> they, take, 
the app. I've got the app and I logged in. I'm not going to re- forget my password. I know. It drives me nuts signing into apps. I'm like, they tell you not to write them all down, but I'm like, but I never remember them all. You know, anyhow, another day, another thing. Yeah. Uh, her husband, they had they had a baby in December, and in the NICU. Yeah. In the NICU. Uh, while I was there, they were actually they actually showed up with the baby. So oh man. Now, which, is, which is great. That is cool. And I didn't I didn't get too close to the baby because you know. Right. New parents, of course. Yeah. <laughs> They'd be like, stand back, you germ carrier. But, uh, yeah. That's awesome. That is that is great. That's a great report. That is good. That is good. 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 Yes. I have two. My dad, um, after two delays of a biopsy, and finally having his results, he does not have prostate cancer. Does not have cancer. That's awesome. That is great. So that's awesome. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
last bit um, prayer concern we have is for Tim Cooper's dad, Larry. He is currently in the hospital at Fort, uh, Fort Wayne Parkview Hospital, and um, it does not look like his heart is going to be able to pull out of this, and he is in um, heart failure. Um, and so the family's uh, all gathered around him and, uh, and being with him, but they know at any, any point that he could pass. And so Tim Cooper's been, he's a big part of our church and leads the community dinners. And, and Larry and Nancy, his parents, they, they love this church and they come down and they are just always just so encouraging and have been uh, through the years. So they're good friends of our church. So definitely please be in prayer for the Cooper family. Yep, yeah, Saran. Mhm. Mm okay. You getting a, like knee replacement or? Yeah. Oh wow! So definitely prayers for Larry. Yeah. Definitely prayers for them and all the schools and cesspool. I mean, schools. Yes, uh, they. Uh, it, it, I'd say it jokingly, but it really is. It's not. It's not a joke. It is. Yeah. Speaking from a kindergarten teacher from a back here, it's like, yeah, April knows. It's like, yikes, yikes. But definitely prayers for them and uh, and yes, absolutely, yeah, and for your family in general as well, Saran. Yes, absolutely. All right. Definitely prayers for, for them all. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Well, Lord, today, I'm starting off this time of sharing together of the good news and the good things that we've seen you up to and the goodness your goodness that is being worked through our lives, we today just give you the utmost praise. And we pray today that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear where it is that you're at work in this world. We're constantly bombarded with how broken the world is and, and, and just constantly bombarded with it. But Lord, help us to see through that thicket and see you at work. Help us to, to begin to recognize your presence where before we just would just look over. So, Father, we pray for eyes to see and ears to hear where you're at work. But, Lord, today we pray also for those families that are walking through a season of grief. Everyone's journey through grief be different, is different. And, Lord, we just pray that you would meet with the families, meet with the individuals right in the midst of the grief, right upon the step of life that they're on. We pray, God, that you would pour your grace through conversations, through friends and family, just being there. And we just pray that, God, that you would just, just continually, by your Spirit, continually guide them, and lead them, lead us into that new normal that, God, that you know, you know we need to be in. Father, today we pray for our congregation, and we just ask, God, that you would bring growth to this service. We pray that, God, that you would Put in our minds and our hearts different ways, different ideas for us to reach out to friends and neighbors. And God, that we would be able to just draw more people into this church. That God, that our light, the light of your love would shine that much brighter. Father, it's not about numbers to us, but God, it is about lives being touched and lives and people experiencing your hope, experiencing your joy, experiencing your peace in the midst of the brokenness of this life. And so, Father, we just pray, pray for growth. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Amen. Hmm. Well, today we're going to eventually be looking at uh, Luke's gospel. And I will omit the title of the message just because it'll give something away. (laughs) But I've had many great teachers through the years. Teachers that have helped and shaped me and part uh, who I am today. You know, the first great teacher that I can remember was that of one Mrs. Mattingly. She was my first grade teacher at the Ligoti Elementary School. She, all those years ago, instilled to me, that, that still flickers within today, a love for all things Australia. Her entire room was decorated from critters from the outback. And so when I would go to elementary school as a first grader, it would be like walking into Australia. It was just so exciting. Fast forward to another great teacher, and Matt, you would, you would know these teachers, uh, we came from the same town, um, but this other teacher whose impact still lingers on me today and, and still seen in my love for novels, for book, was one Mrs. Ackerman. It was in her third grade class that I got picked to be part of this book reading club, and it was then that I was introduced to the world of C.S. Lewis. We read as a group The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which happens to be the second book in the series. It's not even the first. Most people think it's the first, but anyhow. But shortly thereafter, I picked up another fantasy novel, The Hobbit. And to this day, I credit Mrs. Ackerman and, in part, my mom for my love of books. Fast forward even further to one Dr. Smith, who used to teach at Indiana Wesleyan University. And it was his passion For the word of God that took the flicker that was in my heart for God's word and turned it into an inferno. Through his teaching and his love for the word, it was just palpable. And through that teaching, that love for the word, it was stoked in me as well. After one course with him, I could not get enough of the Bible. My final semester at college, I ended up taking five upper-level Bible classes and essentially lived in the library and ended up writing somewhere around 400 pages of research on passages. And I loved every single second of it. And again, credit that back to one Dr. Smith. But who in your life has made such an impact? You know, as a teacher, a school teacher, as a professor... He was a family friend, a family member that you attribute in part who you are and what you are passionate about today. Who is your Dr. Smith? Who's your Mrs. Ackerman? Who's your Mrs. Mattingly? Does anyone want to say anything? Share share a name? Anyone? Anyone? Mr. Dameron. Mr. Dameron. All right. No one else? No one else? All these... Gifts from God and incredible people that have truly made a mark, a lasting mark, lasting impact on our lives. But you know, there's another teacher that we all can be the pupil of, that we can learn a great deal from. This teacher is one that every single one of us, person online, have set under the tutelage of. There's that little house in the prairie coming out again. <laughs> One that isn't really ever sought out. This teacher isn't one that's really sought out, but one that shows up all the same. Well, what teacher am I referring? Well, failure. Failure is one of the, if not the, greatest teachers that you and I can and will ever have. As C.S. Lewis penned, God whispers in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Failure is painful. Amen? Anyone agree? Yes? It can hurt in places that you didn't even know you could hurt. It causes you to take inventory of your life and without all those self-made defenses of pretense and lies that you've been feeding yourself. Who is it that we lie to the most? Craig Gauchel says, ourselves. Well, failure tears apart the lies that we've been feeding ourselves To enable ourselves to live life our way. Failure strips you of everything that you've been hiding behind and masquerading behind and forces you to see clearly you. And being such, as painful as it is, failure in many ways is God's megaphone and it gives to us the opportunity the bad man, he says, can have for amendment. 
It removes the veil and it plants the flag of truth within the fortress of the rebel's soul. Being such, failure often brings about change. Change within our lives. Change, according to Tony Robbins, happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. Failure can bring said pain to said levels to bring about some much needed change in our lives. Failure is often a much needed catalyst for us to try new things and entertain new ways of thinking, of of, of processing, of, of, of looking at, and even living life. It causes us to become open to new possibilities and new ways of being. Failure was one such catalyst in the life of Dallas Jenkins, the main man besides the big man upstairs of The Chosen, the Chosen series that you've been hearing us talk about. Jenkins, before The Chosen, was on a staff at a large church near Chicago. And while there, a Hollywood executive approached him about doing a series of faith-based movies. His plan was for multiple movies, and it was going to be over the course of about a 10-year period. He had the opportunity of a lifetime, the financial backing of Hollywood, and the freedom needed to turn matters of faith into stories that make it on the big screen. Well, let me ask this. Anyone ever heard of the resurrection of Gavin Stone? Doubtful. This was his first film in the series of films, and it was an absolute 100% flop. Ticket sales were abysmal. It raked in only $2.3 million in sales. Concerning this flop, Dallas said, I was home with my wife after the biggest disappointment of my career. The movie that I'd made that had gotten Hollywood attention, distributed all over the country, theaters, completely bombed. He said, I went in just a couple of hours from being a director with a bright future to a director with no future. And what amazes me is it was out of that disappointment It was out of that pain. It was out of that failure that the chosen, now the top crowdfunded project in history, was born. And with that, let us turn to the word to hear of another different kind of failure from the scriptures. This is coming from Luke chapter 5, and it's actually verses 4 and 5. I invite you to stand with me for this brief reading of God's Word. And when Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. Let's pray together. Father, in this continued time of preaching, we pray that you, your Holy Spirit, who inspired the writing of the word, would inspire here today the preaching and hearing of your word. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. May be seated. May be seated. Failed at fishing. Hmm. Now, I've read this passage countless times, yet it wasn't until recently that I got really curious, awfully curious, about what fishing was actually like in the first century. This passage, alongside the chosen's depiction of the fishermen turned disciples, well, sent me on a bit of a hunt. The Sea of Galilee, according to one James Campbell, where this passage took place is a freshwater lake is 13 miles long and 7 miles wide. Since biblical times, the lake has been an important source of food and trade. Ruling tetriarchs of Herod and Philip and sons of King Herod, while living, invested heavily in the trade and caused it during the time of Jesus to flourish. Flourish to the point of their being, according to one Josephus who lived in the first century and was a historian, flourished to the point of being 230 fishing boats that worked the waters. Two boats of which were run by Peter and Andrew and sons of Zebedee, James and John. 
The fish they caught after they paid the tax man and their hired labor was sold locally or salted and preserved to be marketed in places like Jerusalem or even Greece. Fish too small to be marketed were mixed with the entrails of the cleaned fish and salted in a vat. The vats were kept in the sun where the mixture fermented. I mean, it's just like... Eventually, this liquid was strained off and marketed as garum, a fish sauce that was used in almost every meal in the Roman Empire. Distributors, this one got me, of garum made the equivalent of millions of dollars each year. Blech. The fishing industry of Jesus' day, to say the least, was highly profitable. But it was strenuous work, needed a lot of organization. In deep water fishing, two or three boats would work together to set up a net between them and chase the fish into the nets. Now this would be done about seven or eight times during the night. And by morning, the fishermen could bring in a half ton of fish. Fishermen back then fished, and I didn't know this, primarily at night due to the nature of the nets that they used. As a fish would attempt to avoid said nets in the day. On this particular day, when Jesus showed up on the scene, they had been striking out all evening. This incredibly lucrative, money-making industry, hmm, for other people, not them, known as fishing. To pull in an empty hall would have been devastating. Over the course of multiple empty halls, we talk in bankrupt devastating. Talking like, if you're a farmer, no farmer, entire crop gone bad, devastating. And then talking like when Tuttle's Orchard has all their trees nuked by a freeze or a heavy frost, devastating. Talking like a semi turned over and all the goods flowing out on the highway, devastating. Talking like your starting quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, going out and playing four plays and making millions, devastating. After he was hurt for the entire year. <laughs> Talking like putting up the game-winning shot only for it to bounce out of the rim. Devastating. This failure at bringing in a haul, this pain at not having any fish to bring to the market, this failure for Peter of having to tell his wife that he and the boys came up empty, possibly again, well, it opened Peter and Andrew, James and John, like it did Dallas Jenkins, to a wholly different opportunity and different direction for their lives. As my dad put it, and I'm sure Matt can remember him saying this, brokenness creates openness to God. You could hear the pain and frustration in Peter's response to Jesus when Jesus told him to cast the net yet again. You know, he asked them to do so after they had an entire night of work behind them, right? They had just worked and toiled, even the word said, toiled all evening trying to catch fish. Tired to the point of exhaustion, worn out like an old pair of shoes. Man, you could just hear it. And his response is like, Master, why? We toiled all night and took nothing. Uh, he says, that's your word. I'll let down the nets. Ugh. And he did so in complete disbelief. I love this about this passage. He did so grudgingly, right? He did so with no expectations, but of nothing. <laughs> nothing at all. And then when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Now to put this in perspective of just how many fish this were, these boats, they weren't little John boats. These things weren't pontoons. These things were big enough to hold 11 to 13 passengers or a few workers and a half ton of fish. Pretty good sized boats. They're big enough, as we read later in the Gospels, for Jesus to sleep in the hall. 
And here with a word, a word, cast your nets on the other side. They bring in the daytime, mind you, in the daytime, not night as they normally fish, enough fish to cause the boats to begin to sink. And one cast, they caught more than they would normally catch of an entire evening after seven or eight casts. We're talking a ton plus of fish. The hall of all halls. A hall that no one had ever seen and would ever see again. This, was, this is what's possible following failure. We see we run from failure. We, we attempt to protect ourselves from failure. We, we will often not take risks or chances because failure and the pain that comes with it might happen. But failure can be the richest of soil for God to bring forth His most beautiful harvest from our lives. The fishermen from our passage had done it the trades way and it had not worked. The fishermen had done it the way that they had been taught by other fishermen and it resulted in failure. But when those burly fishermen fished Jesus' way, they caught the haul of their life. Someone shared with me after first service that when they went over uh, to, the, uh, to see the Jordan and to this place that believed that this happened, that their tour guide told them that when they cast the net on the other side, it was casting the net into the water that was run off from the mountain that the fish were attracted from because of the warmth of that water coming into the sea. Jesus, a carpenter, hmm, knew a little more about fishing than even those in the trade. And when they did fishing Jesus' way, that was when they truly caught the haul of their life. John Maxwell, in his book, Failing Forward, he sp- spins failure in a completely different, liberating fashion than how we would normally think of it. It's a great book. He argues in this book that we in life can literally fail our way to success. By failing forward. He says, failing forward is the ability to get back up after you've been knocked down. Learn from your mistake. It's very important. (laughs) And move forward in a better direction. Like say how Henry Ford did. Did you know that Henry Ford failed miserably at producing internal combustion cars twice before he got it right? Manufacturing cars in the 1890s was, according to one Robert Greene from the book Mastery, was a daunting adventure. It required a tremendous amount of capital and a complex business structure considering all the parts that went into production. Well, Ford, he got the backing of an extremely well-to-do businessman of Detroit and go Detroit today in football of one William H. Murphy. Together, they formed the Detroit Automobile Company. Yet after only a year and a half, the directors lost faith in Henry and dissolved the company. Fast forward a bit and old Ford and Murphy tried again, this time creating the Henry Ford Company. Murphy, however, due to the last failure, put a great deal of pressure on Mr. Ford to get it right this time and get production up and going. Murphy even brought in an outsider to supervise and look over the shoulder of old Ford. And eventually, Henry, just out of frustration, just up and left the company. This venture lasted less than a year. Yet he didn't allow failure to define him. He didn't listen to the voice of failure when he was down. He rather failed forward and tried again. This time he found a new partner. Learn for those mistakes. One Alexander Malcolmson. Malcolmson had made a fortune off of coal and he was, and I quote, like Ford, had an unconventional streak and was a risk taker. It was then that the Model A came to life. And by 1904, the Ford Motor Company had to expand. From this experience, Henry said, Failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. He learned from every mishap and every mistake. 
And out of the dumpster fire that his failure was, out of the compost pile that his failure was, came his greatest success. This is what is possible when we embrace rather than run from failure. God can use failure like none other to bring about, like with those fishermen, the biggest catch of our lives. But what we must do in the face of failure is not keep trying to do whatever it is the same old way, but try, like the disciples, like Henry Ford, a new way. And for us in our day-to-day lives, that's to be Jesus' way and not our way. They say the definition of insanity is doing what? Doing the same thing and expecting different results. Well, they also say of success, if that first one does not succeed, try, try again. What is needed for true success and for us to fail forward when we do not succeed? Well, what is needed isn't more grit, isn't us just trying harder the same way. It's us doing as the fishermen did when Jesus told them to cast their nets on the other side. It's us approaching work, approaching family, approaching politics, approaching life, approaching whatever it is that's brought the great teacher of failure upon us, and trying again Jesus' way and not our way. It's us doing just as the fishermen did after the hall of all halls. Verse 11 down there says, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything, everything, followed him we in the wake of our failures aren't to wallow in them aren't to allow them to define us aren't to let the failure run infinitely in our heads aren't to give the devil and his minions an easy shot at kicking us while we're down because of failure we're to acknowledge the failure for what it is what it was and learn from it yes but like those fishermen get back up Leave the boat behind and try again Jesus' way by simply following Him with our lives. The folks of the Chosen nailed it when they penned in the interactive study guide. It says, by definition, following Jesus means going where He goes, doing what He does. And this part's the hard part, not choosing for ourselves. It means surrendering. Again, another hard word. Surrendering the control, I like how they say this, we think we have to him. To climb into the passenger seat and hand Jesus the keys. It means believing his way is better than ours. And in so doing, what we'll find out of even the worst of failures is the greatest haul we've ever hauled in life. What we'll find in being willing to take the extended hand of Jesus in our failure, and it's an extended hand and not a finger-pointing hand, is that in trying, try again, we'll be producing our own lives. It's Model A cars. If we'll be willing to hear God's voice, even in the megaphone of pain that failure has inflicted, we'll see our names rolling on those credit scenes, just like Dallas Jenkins and the chosen. We will find the sort of success that we always dreamed possible but had yet found. Because when we are living life Jesus' way, we're living life the way that God designed it. And God has designed life to flourish. Flourish even in times of pain. Flourish even in times of loss. Flourish even in times of storms. Flourish even when the circumstances around us just seem it impossible, that it's impossible for any good to come. Because that's just who God is. And how in the face of this fallen world that our God rolls. So in closing, and this is a brief closing, Corey, let me just say... (laughs) Remember and celebrate those teachers, those people in your life that helped shape you into who you are today. And add another name to that list. Add the name of failure. Embrace even 
this great teacher that failure can be. For from failure, God can do his best sort of work. For it's typically then that we finally get to the end of our ropes and finally become open to what he has been suggesting all along. Corey? Lost. Bye, Corey. So, on another note, who you guys want to win the games tonight? I'm kind of going Detroit and Ravens. Yeah. I think, so. I think I'm hoping those that would be a good Super Bowl. Corey's back. Will you stand with us one last time? Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, the treasures that fail are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me free. Cause the God of the mountain, He is the God of the valley, and there. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. to glory you're the only one who can you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the to gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into
to highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. to highways you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the after that message as we're singing that is like you turn failures into successes <laughs> well may that be our benediction may the god that we serve the god that can turn failures into successes that he would do so in and through our lives amen amen, amen. we'll see you next time and as we like to say around here